Welcome to this Beyond Zero e-learning module. This is one of the VITS RHI catch-up sessions. This particular session is the third part in a series on common complications of HIV infections in children and adolescents. We're going to be focusing on a wide range of conditions, including the central nervous system, hematology, and renal conditions in this presentation. So let's start and look a little bit at the central nervous system and HIV in children. Um, and there's different ways in which HIV affects the central nervous system. And unfortunately, uh, many of the cells within the central nervous system actually has CD4 receptors on them. And you therefore can have a direct effect of the virus. Um, and we'll talk a little bit more about HIV and cephalopathy later on. Well, there's, of course, also an indirect effect. So if a child does often have um, a variety of illnesses, malnutrition, and it's not developing properly, you can also see a delay in, delays in neurodevelopment. There's also specific opportunistic infections that can damage the central nervous system, viral, bacterial, fungal, parasitic. And again, the lower the CD4 count is, the more wider the range of organisms that can attack the central nervous system. And finally, we do see, unfortunately, rarely, but one does sometimes see neoplasia, and in children um, with HIV, uh, one of the carcinomas that is related to that is lymphoma. So if we look at some of the common complications in these children, our biggest challenge um, are the major infections. And probably the most common infection we'll still see is the ordinary bacterial meningitis um, and TB meningitis, especially in children under five where TB infection or TB um, can go very quickly directly to a TB uh, meningitis. But we also see cryptococcus meningitis not as frequently as in adults. Cryptococcus is an organism that we find in, the, in our community around us, um, and not to all children have necessarily contracted the infection and therefore doesn't necessarily progress to cryptococcal meningitis. And then there are much rarer particular illnesses that the child would have had to have, and then the, child, the illness becomes... Um, reactivated, such as CMV encephalitis, varicella reactivation, toxoplasmosis, and herpes simplex. And therefore, these illnesses are actually much more uncommon, especially in the younger child. We do also see um, vasculitis in the children. It's fairly well described with a varied presentation, but also relatively uncommon. And we mentioned earlier that malignancy like lymphomas is also something that needs to be kept in mind. We do, however, want to just have a few slides on HIV encephalopathy in children, as it's quite different um, in the picture that we see in adults. Um, and when you have a child with HIV encephalopathy, that shows advanced clinical disease. So it's usually end-stage HIV. These would be children where they've missed the HIV diagnosis um, for, many t for many years. Um, and ARV certainly helps and can give variable results, um, but it's not always reversible. Therefore, it's essential to diagnose children early with HIV and get them onto ARVs. So how do we diagnose HIV encephalopathy in children? And there are three major features that we're going to look at, um, and it needs to have been present, one of these, for at least two months. So firstly, um, slow achievement or the loss of milestones or loss of intellectual ability. Um, and one has to ask for these specifically, especially in your ill child, where such a lot of focus might be on some of the more immediate medical problems that we're not always asking on how the child is doing at school um, or how the child is doing with achieving their developmental milestones. Sometimes we could also pick it up on examination through an actual acquired microcephaly or a failure of the head to grow. This you would either pick up through um, doing your um, regular head circumferences or one actually has to diagnose it with CT scan. But you can also see a picture of acquired symmetrical motor deficits in a child that's otherwise alert. So either an increased tone or pathologic reflexes or ataxia, gait disturbances, paresis. But again, this will be fairly end stage um, picture of HIV encephalopathy. Probably the most common way that it presents in our setting um, within hospitals and clinics is a child who is not achieving as well at school or is having loss of developmental milestones. To make the diagnosis is mostly dependent on a clinical diagnosis. You have to take a really good birth history to exclude uh, maybe other factors contributing. Um, usually one has to do an LP just to make sure there's no other conditions that are contributing 
normally the, the CSF will give normal or non-specific results. Definitively, we would like to have a CT scan if possible, and this will actually show diffuse brain atrophy. And you need to rule out any other central nervous system infections or conditions that might be contributing. So let's just give an example of the type of child or presentation you may see and may not realize um, could be relevant. So this 15-year-old young man has been on first-line antiretrovirals for seven years. He's an orphan and he stays with his grandmother. He's been on his first-line regimen all this time, but recently his viral load has been rising. He's also been cutting school. He refuses to take his medication and he's now joined a gang. So in this scenario, we would quite often look at the social issues of um, HIV and how that might impact on a child to be moody or depressed. But HIV can also have a direct effect on the cognitive function. And we definitely see mood disorders, for example, depression and anxiety. These are obviously multifactorial. So there's an organic HIV can directly affect um, the brain. Uh, the medication the patient takes might be affecting it, especially if they're on efavirenz. And there's, of course, all the stresses related to the HIV diagnosis. They can also have more complex impairments. So, for example, we do definitely see more learning disorders, more attention deficit, and more oppositional defined disorders in children with HIV. It's important to consider a medication as part of your multifactorial approach and citalopram, as well as bloxtin, can be safely used in conjunction with ARVs. It's very important that this diagnosis is made early on and is addressed aggressively, um, because it not only impacts, obviously, on the quality of life of the child, um, but also on their ability to take the ARVs and on other important factors, such as suicide risk. So let's move on to something quite different now. We're going to focus a little bit on CMV, um, which has an effect on the neuro central neurosystem, system, um, but can actually affect many organs um, within children with that. So the cytomegalovirus, just a few little slides to remind us, is from the herpes virus family. It's a double-stranded DNA enveloped virus. Um, and in Africa, the primary infection occurs already usually within the first six to nine months of life. So most of us have picked up the virus quite early in life. In immune competent children, this usually be, it will be asymptomatic or a mononucleosis like illness. Um, but in immunosuppressed children, you can get a disseminated disease that may affect all the organs. So what's important in our population is that 90% of our HIV infected women are CMV antibody positive. Um, an infection occurs often during infancy, early childhood or adolescence, and you can get the virus via contact with virus containing saliva, urine, sexual fluid, breast milk, blood, um, also transplantations. And perinatal infection is very common in these moms who might be shedding quite a bit of the virus. If we look at the clinical manifestations um, of a child with HIV who does have cytomegalovirus, um, it's a huge challenge because it can actually accelerate the HIV progression. And children who are co-infected are more likely to develop HIV-C and central nervous system disease. CMV retinitis, which we often see in the adult, or adults, is frequently asymptomatic in the early stages, and children might not report abnormalities. And older children may have floaters or loss of peripheral central vision, but may not necessarily um, report it to their teachers or the adults. So this is a picture of retinal pathology caused by the cytomegalovirus. Um, classically, you have areas of retinal necrosis with hemorrhage, and that's the typical picture of the melted cheese and the um, tomato sauce. If we look at the clinical manifestations a little bit further, um, it's a challenge. Quite often, they'll have very nonspecific symptoms if they have disseminated cytomegalovirus infection with weight loss, loss of developmental milestones, fever, anemia, thrombocytopenia. And they can have a range of gastrointestinal possibilities. You can get oral or esophageal ulcers. Um, one can have an ascending cholangiopathy um, or CMV colitis that might present with bloody um, diarrhea. And often, these opportunistic infections with CMV is, is confused with other possible infections. So, for example, esophageal ulcers will be confused with esophageal candidiasis. Um, CMV colitis often can be confused with other causes of 
um, intestinal problems. But CMV can also attack the respiratory symptoms with a CMV pneumonia, with shortness of breath, and a dry, non-productive cough it can easily be confused with, for example, pneumocystis carinii pneumonia. And your CNS manifestations can include encephalopathies, myelitis, a polyradiculopathy with non-specific or even normal CSF. So to be very alert in somebody, for example, who have a, a, a coming with a paresis with a very um, suggestive picture of Coda equina syndrome, to keep this in mind in somebody with an HIV and a low CD4 count, as it's potentially reversible if one can put them on treatment early. This is just an X-ray of a CMV um, of the lungs, and as you can see, very um, generalized features of bilateral increased interstitial markings be very difficult to differentiate from um, PJP, for example. So the diagnosis is very challenging because of the ubiquitous nature of CMV infection. Everybody has it. Um, the presence of viral shedding and the absence of relevant disease. And only positive histology can actually confirm end organ disease um, where negative histology does not exclude it. So antibody assays are actually not very useful at all um, because most of us would have been infected by it in, as a, in a young age. In children under a year old, it could also be maternal IgG that you might be seeing. Positive cell cultures um, can be useful from urine, tissues, and blood leukocytes, but it's not that easy to culture and expensive, where probably the preferred test is a DNA PCR test, and if possible, to actually do a viral load. Although we do have treatment for the cytomegalovirus, it's similar to our other herpes viruses, is that you cannot completely eradicate it. Um, and the aim of the treatment is to reduce the viral load and therefore the associated clinical symptoms and to see if you can put the illness into a remission period. Very important is that one has to start ARVs to help the immune system to recover and to reduce the chances of a relapse. The treatment in children is ganciclover at 5 milligrams per kilograms IV um, 12 hourly usually a shorter course of 14 to 21 days for CMV pneumonitis or hepatitis, um, and 21 to 28 days for an esophagitis or colitis. Retinitis and CNS involvement should ideally have three to six months of maintenance therapy, and those will certainly have to be managed by an expert. So let's move on to um, renal conditions. And here again, I would like to look at a specific case of a five-year-old boy was diagnosed with HIV infection two months ago after being admitted with pneumonia. He was started on ARVs the previous month due to a CD4 of 220. Um, and his father has noted that he has puffiness around his eyes every morning. And he's concerned that it might be a reaction to the ARVs. So what do we do in a case like this? So firstly, just an important note that every concern raised by a caregiver about the safety or efficacy of the ARVs should receive your attention, never just be dismissive. Um, and quite often we develop either an iris or symptoms after starting on ARVs and the patient might mistakenly believe it is the treatment. It's very important to have a discussion and to listen to their concerns to ensure that you can clarify those concerns. So in this child we do a urine dipstick um, and we find that there's three plus proteinuria. So where do we go next? So let's look a little bit at HIV associated proteinuria in um, our HIV children, and 10% of HIV-infected children will present with proteinuria at some point. Very important that all patients with 2-plus proteinuria need to be investigated. Um, and for this, we can either do a 24-hour urine protein and create an excretion. That's usually not practical. But the one thing that should be possible to do is a random protein-creatinine ratio. And we do this by taking a random urine sample, um, sending it off, and then dividing the urine protein by the urine creatinine. So normal values we would want in children under two for that to be less than 0.5. And in children over the age of two, we would want that to be less than 0.2. So we expect that there must be much less protein in the urine than creatinine. So let's look at some of the causes of proteinuria in HIV infected children. Um, the most, most common cause is still actually our focal segmental glomerulonecrosis as we see in our HIV-negative children. Um, but we do see high VAN in children. So that's your HIV-associated nephropathy. It can start between the ages of three to five years. 
you can have a very quick progression to end stage renal failure. So these are children who have not yet been started on ARVs, and ARVs can certainly slow down the progress and certainly improve it. But another reason why we have to start children on ARVs um, very early in life. Um, and ACE inhibitors are usually used in, in these scenarios. We do also see um, causes of interstitial nephritis, particularly with medication. So our HIV-infected children are more likely to be treated with drugs such as rifampicin or aminoglycosides, which might um, be toxic to the kidneys. And you can get a direct um, infiltration of the kidneys by mycobacteria, um, which can also cause an interstitial nephritis. But with HIV-infected children, there's additional issues. And of course, we do often see our very, very ill, acutely ill children can go into acute renal failure due to dehydration or sepsis or the medication. Um, and infective causes can also directly affect those kidneys, be it gram-negative bacteria, Mysteria, chlamydia, mycobacteria, or CMV. Practically, it means that we do need to do routine urine dipsticks on HIV-infected children. Um, and I think although we're pretty good with the adults, we do forget with the kids. And if there's 2-plus proteinuria or more, that will justify a referral. We do not use tenofovir in children, um, although there is a place for it in uh, children who are failing um, second-line treatment. Tenofovirus, we are particularly concerned because of the hypophosphatemia that it can cause, and this could be asymptomatic with a normal creatinine. And if a child is going through a growth spurt during that time, it could contribute to an osteoporosis in a child. Um, that, however, saying if one was to monitor children very carefully, it is a drug that has a possibility. It certainly doesn't have any higher risk to the kidneys than in the adult population. When we are prescribing medication, we need to bear in mind this potential effect of the medication on renal function, um, as it should for other areas as well, especially dentamycin, which can affect both the kidneys as well as the ears. HIV can affect um, all areas, and the musculoskeletal system is also. So this particular case is of a six-year-old girl, and the mom says that she's been crying due to pain in the, her joints for the last um, couple of weeks, and this has been present for the last six weeks now. When you examine her, you notice that the fingers, the wrists, the elbows, and the knees are warm, red, swollen, and painful, and that she has generalized lymphadenopathy. And you notice in the history and in the notes that she's actually been diagnosed with HIV within the last month. So when we look at children with arthritis with HIV, our differential diagnosis is a little bit wider, or we think about it slightly differently than in HIV-negative children. Of far, our most common things we want to exclude is our infective causes, and we obviously want to make sure we don't have a septic joint um, that would usually be more of a single joint. We want to look for bacteria and also keep in mind TB. But probably more common is your reactive um, arthritis, post-viral infections or post-bacterial infections. <clears throat> and in HIV-positive children, there's a much higher risk of them having um, both a variety of infections, but also there's a higher um, incidence of reactive arthritis. But we do also see autoimmune disorders in HIV-infected children, including your normal juvenile arthritis. But there's also a specific HIV-associated arthritis, um, and again, usually in children with lower CD4 counts. Rheumatic fever we can see in both HIV-negative and positive children. And of course, to consider hemophilia um, as, as part of your differential. So how do we manage these painful joints in HIV-infected children? Um, important first is to exclude infections. Examine the child well, do your full blood counts, your CRPs. You may have to do an X-ray. Um, and if you're able to get fluid out of the knee, we would certainly need to culture that and to look for TB. Very important to stage the child and initiate on ARVs. And then to do your um, normal analgesia support using ibuprofen. Um, if infection has been excluded and you are concerned that it might be more one of your reactive or um, juvenile arthritis, then we need to start them on ARVs and refer to a pediatrician. And sometimes they do need immune modulatory medications such as salazoprine or prednisone. Hematology. So we have a seven-year-old HIV-infected boy who's been on his first regimen for three years. He's got a CD4 of 15 and a viral load of 410,000 when you see him today. 
He presents with severe epistaxis. And on clinical examination, he is pale, he has petechiae on his trunk. And when you do a full blood count, we discover he's got an HB of 4, normochromic, normocytic, and a platelet count of 6. So this is just to look a little bit at thrombocytopenia in the HIV-infected child. Um, and our classic classification is similar to our HIV negative. It's either due to impaired thrombopoiesis or due to peripheral destruction. So why might we not be making enough platelets? And unfortunately, HIV can infiltrate and directly affect the um, production of platelets <coughs> in the bone marrow. But there's also a variety of other infections that can affect the bone marrow, such as mycobacteria, CMV, Epstein-Barr virus, as well as parvo. Various medications can have an effect on platelets. It's interesting and important to note that AZT, although it can affect both the hemoglobin um, as well as the white cell count, does not affect the platelets. Um, but we also various nutritional deficiencies can contribute, um, as well as malignant bone marrow infiltration. Usually in HIV-infected children, we will be most concerned about infections. On the other side, it might be due to destruction, either immune thrombocytopenia purpura, your ITPs, DIC in your very sick children. It could be um, HUS or TTP, or it might be due to splenic sequestration. So how do you approach this in your um, primary healthcare district hospital setting? Um, and first, of course, make sure you have a full full blood count so we can see if there's concomitant anemia and leukopenia. And usually if you have anemia, leukopenia, as well as thrombocytopenia, we're definitely concerned about um, some sort of bone marrow infiltration. Um, your red cell fragmentation on your full blood count will give you a clue on whether you're looking at a DIC or an HUS or a TTP. Um, and if there's toxic granulation, that's indicative of infection. Usually with a pancytopenia, we're usually assuming it's something like TB or MAC, and you can start treatment um, and see if it recovers if they have a set of TB symptoms. But if you don't have other TB symptoms or if you start a TB treatment and it's not dramatically improving, you need to do a bone marrow biopsy. If you do diagnosed ITP, an important note here is that we manage it with IV polygam and prednisone and to not transfuse with platelets um, as they will simply be destroyed. And all of these patients must be referred to a pediatrician and should not be managed um, on a district level. So this is the last slide for um, the three presentations on complications in common complications in children. Um, it was literally just a touch on a variety of different conditions that might be affecting children. And it's worthwhile to go and um, look these up further if you are not confident on them. Very important that we start our children early on ARVs and very important to use prophylaxis appropriately as indicated. Thank you very much again to Vitz RHI and Dr. Lizelle Kiet for the excellent set of slides and cases.